myself from the spotlight and hand it over to Lyra, who will introduce our afternoon session. It's all yours, Lyra. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome back, everyone, um, wherever you are <laughs> uh, in the world, to this afternoon session. I am super delighted to be sharing the discussions this afternoon of what I think will be two super interesting presentations. Uh, they both concern the notion of queer utopia or pervtopia, suggesting different new perspectives on queer and creep, joy, pain, and futurity, futurity, futurity. Since these papers seem to have a lot in common, although I'm sure they will prove to be deviant from each other as well, uh, I would like to suggest that we save all questions and comments uh, for a common discussion at the end, uh, if both speakers would be okay with that. I'm okay with it. Yeah, that would be cool. Great, yeah, thank fine. you. Brilliant. Um, because I imagine that some might want to ask uh, you the same questions or address their questions to both of you and also that you might want to comment on each other's papers. Um, cool, let's do that. So then we will begin uh, and I am happy to introduce Balam Nadim Kenter, uh, who is a PhD candidate at Concordia University's Center for Interdisciplinary Studies in Society and Culture. And they will be presenting a paper in, entitled Access and Excess, Queering and Creeping Towards Pertopia. Welcome, Balam. Thank you. Yeah, great to be here. Hello from Istanbul, actually. I'm not in Concordia right now. I've been here since the pandemic. Um, yeah, I'm going to share my screen. At some point, I'm going to share another screen. I hope it's going to work. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let me turn the. I'm going to turn the subtitles on so that it's a bit more accessible. Uh, so yeah, the title we've already read it. I'm just going to go fast. This was originally a 35-page paper, so I'm going to breeze through some stuff. If you are confused and/or interested, please do ask me in the end. Um, if it needs to be extended, um, how can I make myself smaller? Okay, so um, utopias are often imagined as enclaves bounded against disability, death, and dystopia, as I observed. Um, if utopia is a desirable imagined futurity, those who are excluded from desirable futures are residents of dystopia, or worse, they're already obsolete. If utopia is always against death, as Adorno famously claims, those who are excluded from utopian visions belong to the realm of death, the realm of non-futurity. According to Lee Edelman, queers are one such group, excluded from heteronormative futures predicated on the phantasmagoric figure of the child. Another such group is the disabled, or as Childrick would put it, those with anomalous body minds who exceed the boundaries of normative embodiment, subjectivity, and identity with their instability and irreducible difference. Uh, in Crip Theory, Robert McCrewer argues that compulsory heterosexuality and compulsory able-bodiedness are mutually constitutive systems which are in turn shaped by capitalism. Jose Munoz and Jack Halberstam propose queer as a utopian temporality that can disrupt both heteronormative and homonormative futurities. And in Feminist Queer Crip, Elson Kafer forges together both queer and crip temporalities in the interest of advancing the work of constructing desired queer crip futures. So, um, sorry. In my work, I draw from all of these works, but I find that they don't engage with either disability or death, one or the other. Um, and Lee Edelman's work is problematic because it's not intersectional, but his utopian non futurity provides a productive paradox from which I derive the idea of a perverse utopia or pervtopia, which engages with that disability and excess. Uh, to bring together these different strands into imagining a queer creep pertopia, I had turned to the life work of Bob Flanagan, the supermasochist. Uh, Flanagan was a performance artist who brought into conversation his cystic fibrosis, CF, and masochism, SM, or what I call notions of disability and excess, with perversity and excess. I hope I'll get to um, Bob's sec uh, section. Um, my plan of talk is in three conceptual parts, moving from futurity to non-futurity to per-futurity. 
Okay, um, and the too long don't read version of what I'm going to try to do in this talk is um, that there are basically two problems with utopian visions, at least two problems. Uh, one is that even the most non-normative utopias tend to exclude disability and or death. And in relation to this, I think in connection to this, utopian visions risk being renormalized or co-opted by the system, which is also predicated on notions of futurity. Um, so instead of setting up non-futurity against futurity as a solution to these problems, I propose to dissolve this binary through per-futurity. And per-futurity brings about a different temporality through its engagement with death and disability, um, because it is a sense of durationality, which is found in the paradoxical space between certainty and uncertainty, between the certainty of death and possibility of utopia. So let's go into um, queer futurity, queer as utopian. Halberstam claims that queer time develops different notions of location and identification in opposition to heteronormative institutions of family and reproductivity, the logics of longevity and capitalist inheritance. Halberstam aims to dissociate queerness from a way of having sex and connect it to a way of life in order to think about it as an outcome of strange temporalities imaginative life schedules and eccentric economic practices. While the notion of queer time may owe its origins to the compression and an annihilation of time in the HIV AIDS crisis, it also evokes potentialities produced by queer subcultures, which allow the imagining of non-normative affinities, embodiments and activities of futures that evade the temporal frames of capitalist production and heteronormative reproduction. Again, straight times linear life narrative of birth, marriage, reproduction, and death, Halberstam proposes to explore the stretched out adolescences of queer subculture. In Cruising Utopia, Munoz provocatively suggests that queerness is not yet here, but on the horizon as a potentiality. We've never been queer, yet queerness exists for us as an ideality that can be distilled from the past and used to imagine a future. Munoz is setting up queer as utopian, not only in, a, in opposition to the futurity of reproductive majoritarian heterosexuality, but also as against homonormative LGBT movements focused on integrating with the dominant institutions of heteropatriarchal capitalism, such as family, military, and white collar work. Beyond this assimilationist paradigm that traps politics in the pragmatism of the here and now, and which naturalizes both capitalism and heteronormativity, Munoz evokes blocks temporal calculus that can activate both the past and the future against the tyranny of straight times present. Munoz wants to dream up queerness as a thoroughly politicized intersectional collectivity that simultaneously remi remains as a potentiality in the past and something that is to yet to come. Um, in Crip Futurity, um, which thinks about desired disabled futures, Ellison Kafer draws from both of these works and critiques them. Um, and Kafer adopts the term Crip theory coined by McCrewer instead of disability theory because Crip, like queer, is expansive, ever-changing, contested, coalitional, thoroughly political, and thus conducive to be claimed by those it did not originally define. In line with this, Kafer offers to look at disability and impairment as collective affinities of all who live under systems of compulsory able-bodied mindedness, um, which encompasses everyone from people with learning disabilities to those with chronic illness, like Bob Flanagan, uh, from people with mobility impairments to those with HIV AIDS, uh, from people with sensory impairments to those with mental illness. In Kafer's model, disability is a site of ongoing inquiry and collective reimagining, rather than a set of fixed definitions or essential attributes locatable in certain bodies. All bodies are, and minds are subject to ableist neuronormative and body normative systems, as well as shifting abilities through time and context. Thus, whether disabled or non-disabled, all are implicated in such oppressive systems. Accessible futures then should interest and implicate non-disabled people as well. Kafer then brings together queer and crypt time, examining Halberstam's strange temporalities, eccentric economic practices, and imaginative life schedules through the lens of disability, and they were quite well together, actually. Uh, queer time forced through the HIV AIDS paradigm already includes disability and disease. Um, so queer time, in some sense, is already crypt time. But crypt time also exceeds queer time. Kafer critiques Halberstam for their stance against longevity, because it's not against longevity per se, but longevity under all conditions. It does seems to be set up against the stability, sickness, and old age. Also, the notion of reimagining lost pasts in Munoz and Halberstam poses the danger of turning into normalizing nostalgia, such as those imposed on disabled lives, fetishizing the temporality of before disability, even if it doesn't exist. 
Um, so what most stands out from all three accounts is the deployment of resources from the past and future as a critique of the present, complicating the linear construction of straight time. Straight time is also the temporality of capitalism, progress, and productivity. Um, the strange temporalities of queer and crypt time offer a glimpse of a non-capitalist world, alternative relations and modes of exchange and production, as well as non-productivity across diverse collective affinities. Kafer's reading of queer time through a crypt perspective reveals that even queer time may retain traces of normativity that may set up futurities against disability and ability. But these are still accounts that invest hope in some kind of futurity. So now let's turn to non-futurity. Um, so Lee Edelman in No Future, uh, says that like the death drive and its exceeding of the symbolic order, the practice of queer sexualities holds the capacity to become a truly oppositional politics. The right wing conceives of queerness as a threat that can destroy society as such. Edelman proposes that this is indeed the, the kind of disorientation that queer sexualities should entail. Um, and Edelman says that queerness should and must redefine such notions as civil order through a rupturing of our foundational faith in the reproduction of futurity. Politics, insofar as it is always in the service of a better futurity that defines itself against dystopian death, symbolizing the bodies of certain people, is the utopian. So as such, Edelman's project is anti-utopian. But Edelman is at the same time very much talking about a queerness that is not yet present, um, but an ethical and strategic potentiality a queerness yet to come. So this is a futurity that paradoxically poses a non-futurity, and this is where I get the inspiration for a perverse utopianism. But it's not at all clear that queerness alone will do the work of perverting the dominant social order, especially if it is a queerness that is not informed by a politics of collective affinity proposed by Kafer or a politics of intersectionality proposed by Munoz um, that could both harness the collective power of all those who pose a non-normative threat to normative futurities. Queers are by no means the only constituency that normative politics would like to eradicate from its futurity, as we've already seen. So I, of course, agree with this critique, um, but I want to retain sort of like a part of Edelman's provocation, uh, where Edelman proposes that queers accept, embrace, and embody their association with the death drive, the inarticulable surplus that dismantles the subject from within, or a mode of impossible access haunting reality. Um, in the same way in which sort of like disability and death haunts all utopias. Uh, this perverse engagement with death is appealing, but of course it doesn't include disability and it's not intersectional. Uh, on the other hand, queer time and crypt time do not engage with death. So I propose to engage both, both of them as the limits and pot potentialities of utopia. Um, I'm gonna now try to um, share another screen and sort of introduce um, Bob Flanagan. How many minutes do I have? Um, well, actually, we have two hours in total, so I don't think we need to be too sharp on the timelines. So do take your time. A couple of minutes over is no problem. It's super. So can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So this is from a documentary called Sick, The Life and Death of Bob Flanagan, the Super Masochist. Uh, it's a biographical documentary that was planned and executed so as to end with documenting Flanagan's death. And it begins with Bob Flanagan reading his future obituary in the past tense. Bob Flanagan, artist, masochist, and one of the longest living survivors of cystic fibrosis, lost his battle this week with the killer disease, a genetic disorder of the lungs and pancreas that both played and empowered the provocative performer throughout his difficult but productive life. Born in New York City on December 26, 1952, Flanagan was in and out of hospitals most of his life. Doctors gave him little chance of survival past the age of six or seven years, but survive he did, well beyond anyone's expectations. The gift, difficulties of being sick became subject for much of his work. All the articles about me start that way. Bob Flanagan should be dead by now. <laughs> but he isn't, that's what I was saying. <laughs> Instead, he nails his dick to a board, and that's how it that's <laughs> I'm going to go back to my slides now. Sorry, I couldn't find a way to put the video in my slides. So um, there we go. So um, in this video, Flanagan is giving an account of his life and death at once. Um, Flanagan is not yet dead as he has failed or exceeded expectations in this regard, but he's certainly dying. Uh, since the film is conceived as such a document from the outset, we know before watching the film, even from the title, that by the time we watch the film, Flanagan will have been dead. 
and Flanagan knows this too. So at this point in the film, Flanagan is not yet dead, dying and dead, a queer temporality indeed. Um, so later in the same documentary, Sarah, who was at the time a 16 year old with cystic fibrosis as well, and who has somehow perversely reached Flanagan of all people through the Make-A-Wish Foundation, um, uh, makes a remark and says, my life is about death, I guess. And I guess to reverse it, my death will be about life as well because of how I'm dying. Uh, so death is a certainty, death is certain, but the how and the when evades certainty. In the case of cystic fibrosis, however, the how and when of death are kind of more certain than most deaths, uh, usually by lung disease, usually before the age of 50, if not much earlier. Um, during the time Bob Flanagan was active, um, he was one of the longest survivors of um, cystic fibrosis. I think it's um, the lifespan is a little bit longer now uh, with medical advancements, but at the time he was 40 um, and um, he was one of the long survivors. Usually um, people with cystic fibrosis died very early on when they were children. Um, and Bob Flanagan was actually part of um, cystic fibrosis camps for children for about 20 or 22 years until the, the time he died actually. Um, so in Sarah's and Flanagan's case, it seems that impending death does not necessarily or only compress and annihilate time, but rather performs a queer reversal, making life about death and death about life. The challenge and absolute limit that death poses becomes complicated with the how I'm dying process, which begins at birth in the case of cystic fibrosis. Death exceeds the present. It cannot be contained by the present tense. I am dead is an impossible uttering as Zeynep Sayin says. How I'm dying, however, introduces a possibility into the impossibility of the utterance I am dead because it constitutes an uncertain certain duration which encompasses past, present, and future. How I'm dying then is the pervtopic dimension where Flanagan operates rather than the urgency of the compressed present. It brings about a perversely calm level-headedness that commits not to a futurity, but to an uncertain certain durationality, which is coupled not with the mere acceptance of that, but even a desiring thereof. And like cystic fibrosis, um, ceramesochism or SM, uh, which, was, which was what it was called at the time, now we call it BDSM, um, which um, Bob Flanagan was a, sort of like a public practitioner of, it was part of his uh, performance art as well. Uh, so SM is also about limits, the limits of the body-mind, the limits of endurance and pain, the limits of control and surrender. And it is rife with rich pertofi possibilities because it offers glimpses of relationalities that require communication, trust, care, expertise, consent, pain and pleasure, seriousness and play in a way in which no normative form of relationality can currently demand, offer or imagine in any intelligible manner. And this might be partly because BDSM is ultimately a matter of life and death as well. So in Flanagan's life work, CF and SM coexist, feed one another, and seep into one another in mutually productive and inter interesting ways, particularly pronounced and crystallized in Flanagan's later work, where he always takes up CF and SM together, his lungs and, and his dick, his yin and yang, as he calls them, the two limits he keeps pushing, redefining, and perverting. Um, if I have time, I'm going to show another video. If not, I'll, I'll cut it shorts i can't see you do have time how many it's minutes? only been like 15 minutes since you started oh, okay. talking so okay. Okay, super so i'm gonna let's see i'm gonna do another one so this is the cystic fibrosis song it's um sort of towards the end of um flanagan's life um and this is a tune that is sort of like perverted from um mary poppins uh, the disney um cartoon start coming the tune to super califragilistic and i have the lyrics um on the side so that you can uh, so i wrote this song and i know the disney people if anybody any disney people are here they will probably tell me to cease and desist and, and believe me i will but uh, <laughs> not yet in my own time <laughs> Super masochistic, Bob is cystic fibrosis. He should have died when he was young, but he was too precocious. How much longer he will live is anyone's prognosis. Super masochistic, Bob is cystic fibrosis. <coughs> I'm the little, little, I'm gonna die. I'm the little, I'm gonna die. I'm the little, I'm gonna die. I'm the little, I'm gonna die. When he was born, the doctor said he had this bad disease. It gave him awful stomach aches and made him cough and wheeze. 
Any normal person would have buckled from the pain. But Super Bob got twisted, now he's into whips and chains. I'm the little I'm gonna die. And you get the idea of that before I kill myself. I'm the little I'm gonna die. 40 years have come and gone, and Bob is still around. He's tied up by his ankles and he's hanging upside down. A lifetime of infection, and his lungs all filled with phlegm. The CF would have killed him if it weren't for S and M. Oh, super masochistic bobocystic fibrosis. Super masochistic bobocystic fibrosis. Super masochistic bobocystic fibrosis. Super masochistic bobocystic fibrosis. Sorry. Okay. Um. So, this is one of the instances where I see sort of like access, like disability access and access coming together. Uh, the way sort of he has his wear hospital gown, like a superhero cape, and he has a permanent catheter attached to his chest for um, injecting antibiotics and medicine and so on. Um, and then he has coming from his oxygen tube, uh, the holder for that, he has the letter S for super masochist, which also references, I think, the S on Superman's chest. Um, and um, he has large overexposed veins that go across his entire torso, as well as many marks and scars. But it's not really clear if it's from years of being treated for CF, um, getting fluids extracted out of his chest cavity because it fills up with phlegm, uh, or from years of being suspended upside down, pierced and cut during his s and practice. Um, and throughout the performance, I've, as we've seen, is coughing and wheezing, clearing his throat, stopping and resting after challenging fast repetitions, and laughing and making jokes about dying, none of this failure of giving an uninterrupted smooth performance takes away anything, but sort of adds to the poignance of an irony of the performance evidenced by the enthralled audience laughing with them the whole time. Um, so the oxygen tubes and catheter are both access technologies that keep him alive, but they're also props in his performance, literally a part of the super masochist costume. Um, and, um, so it's not, nothing is kind of clear, like Sam might have, might have or might not have contributed to his longevity. Um, the questions and answers proliferate, the rug is pulled under from the medical establishment. Um, is anyone's prognosis, um, how long, um, you know, uh, Bob will live, but he'll keep going and he'll keep doing uh, whatever he's doing, just like um, he worked at that um, children's camp for 20 years. That's sort of like what I mean by duration there, sort of like this certain uncertainty and the level-headedness about it. Um, the only two phrases that keep getting repeated in the song are only are also only certainties in this narrative. Impending death, the I'm the little, I'm gonna die, and the fact that Flanagan has CF and is into SNM. And indeed, the I'm gonna die bit um, is the one sentence each of us can utter or, or sing in complete epistemic certainty. Um, death is always in the future. Death to come is certain, although it cannot be contained by certainty as the how and when evade that. Uh, death is certainly certain and uncertainly certain. There is no future without death, but death is also non-futurity, at least in utopian visions. Utopia must exceed the present for something else, something that isn't now. Like death, utopias are also in the future, but unlike death, the utopia to, to come is uncertain, yet it cannot be contained by con the uncertainty either, because for some utopias may reach back to the past and some utopias may find anticipatory illuminations in the present. So utopias exceed certainty without becoming certain. Utopias are certainly uncertain and uncertainly certain. But if utopia is futurity and there is no futurity without death, then a utopia that doesn't take death into account is no place indeed. Uh, on the other hand, utopia can't afford to take death into account for death is certainty and utopia is possibility. But I think there's a space between certainty and possibility, which I would like for utopia to occupy as an impossible temporality. And I think anomalous body minds and many others who exceed the able-bodied imagination of utopia are residents of utopia. The impossible excess of death and the, and the impossible excess of the desired, desirable, and desiring crypt body minds might allow us to access the protopic realm, which is home to and at home with such contradictions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Balam, with silent applause. I hope I didn't go over time. I don't, no, I think this is great. Uh, it's gonna, I at least have a lot of questions to you already <laughs> in my mind, and I'm sure others do as well. But please uh, note them down and save them until later. Because uh, now it's my great pleasure to introduce Catherine Fisher, who is a graduate student in philosophy at University College Dublin. 
and will be presenting a paper entitled No Future for Queers, an Investigation into Pregnancy and Queer Joy as Utopia. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you for the introduction, Lyra, and what a wonderful paper, Balam. I'm really excited to um, pick your brain about it in a little bit. And it does set up quite a few of the themes I'm also drawing on, which is fantastic. So I'm just going to share my screen as well now. Um, great. And let's get started. Hold on. Okay, so yeah, so I'm going to be looking today at essentially pregnancy as a queer bodily experience and kind of want to explore that notion and think through what that might mean for um, this discount specifically queer people, but I think um, in a larger realm also maybe for other um, social groups that have been excluded from a kind of reproductive futurity such as disabled people. Um, so for a very quick outline of what I'm looking at today, I'm going to give a quick introduction um, into the no future approaches um, in, in queer theory, which mostly um, Malam has really wonderfully outlined as well. Um, then I'm going to be looking at the experience of pregnancy. So um, I'm from a background in phenomenology and I'm going to be essentially looking at the phenomenology of pregnancy. Um, and through that, try and establish pregnancy as a queer bodily experience and then think about how this implies a queer or queering of future, kind of how we might think about futuristic but non-heteronormative accounts of queer pregnancy and reproduction. So to begin with, um, queer theory has been permeated but what uh, Jack Halberstam calls an antisocial turn. Um, so the idea is basically that um, queerness is something that negates um, a lot of the ways in which futurity in a heteronormative society is imagined. So for example, pregnancy is firmly associated with a reproductive futurity, which is a thing of heterosexual relationships and patriarchal heteronormativity. Um, so there's a very famous paper by Leo Bersani from 1987 in which he asked the question, is the rectum a grave? And his argument in this is essentially that um, the sexuality of um, gay or queer men, similar to that of women, so for sexuality associated with femininity really is, um, is one that, as he says, in, is intrinsically diseased, not necessarily, but as in like, that's how it's portrayed in society. Um, and he thinks about the rectum somewhat metaphorically, somewhat literally as somewhere where dominant masculine subjectivity essentially finds its death. So he talks about how um, in some sex acts, queer men will put themselves into positions literally like the ways that women are put into by society um, that are kind of demeaning. Um, he talks about, you know, on your back with your legs up high in the, um, in the air. And he says that this kind of, the way that this masculinity, this dominant masculine subjectivity finds its death in the rectum should actually be something that, that is embraced. Um, that we don't want to reproduce that. Um, a very similar argument can be found in Lee Edelman's work where he also says that um, queerness is kind of a radical opposition to futurity where futurity is a normative optimism perpetuated in reproductive, future-oriented heteronormativity that is symbolized in the child, capital letters. Um, so he also in that sense kind of advocates for a positive spin on a homophobic negative stereotype where, so he's saying that queerness as a threat to heteronormative society is not a negative stereotype, but rather that something that we should uh, challenge and, and try to get to. Um, I, in this talk, I think essentially problematized it a little bit, um, and I will get it right into how I'm going to do that now. So my starting point is um, this quote from a 2015 book by Maggie Nelson, sometimes called an auto theory because it both combines on autobiographical elements. So she reflects on her life, her family and her relationships and uh, a dialogue or discussion with the theory that she engages with. And so that's a kind of intertwinement of them both. And she asks in this book, is there something inherently queer about pregnancy itself? Insofar as it profoundly alters one's normal state and occasions a radical intimacy with and radical alienation from one's body. How can an experience so profoundly strange and wild and transformative also symbolize or enact the ultimate conformity? 
I find that question really striking because what Nelson does in there, she kind of um, challenges both the notion of pregnancy and the notion of queerness because she posits pregnancy as something queer and queerness as potentially involving a queer reproduction, which really goes against the no future account. So yeah, I'm going to um, basically start off by doing the phenomenology thing where I take this piece of lived experience and I try to make sense of it um, through phenomenological descriptions of pregnancy. So um, I've drawn out basically four dimensions of pregnancy that um, Nelson seems to be describing here, which is that pregnancy is a disruption to the habitual body that pregnancy involves a radical alienation from one's body, but also a radical intimacy with one's body, and that pregnancy is a transformative experience. Uh, I want to give two quick notes before I go on. On um, First one is on my language, um, so I'm going to be trying to use gender neutral language as we go along, but there is elements in when it comes to pregnancy, because it's often a very gendered experience and because it has a very gendered history, there is, um, for example, the literature refers to maternal fetal relationships, and I haven't yet found a way to you know, both acknowledge that it's not only women who get, women who get pregnant, um, but also keep that gendered element in. So I appreciate if you have any ideas on that. The other one is um, on my understanding of queer. So I mostly follow, I guess, um, Sarah Ahmed's um, understanding of um, queer, where queer is not just non-straight sexual practices that are a form of social and sexual contact, but also that which is, as she puts it, oblique or offline or even just plain wonky. So to say that something is queer, therefore, is to suggest something is deviant disruptive or off track of the normal. So, pregnancy is a really fascinating bodily experience and phenomenology is kind of really well suited to explore it because in phenomenology, we mostly focus on um, experience as it comes sort of to the first person um, um, and looking at, I, I mostly draw on Merleau-Pontian phenomenology where we focus a lot on the body and um, bodily experiences. And one of the um, most famous accounts of a phenomenology of pregnancy comes from Iris Marion Young. It's a 1984 paper where she draws on the way that Simone de Beauvoir and Julia Kristeva talk about pregnancy to suggest that subjectivity in pregnancy is split, decentered, and doubled. So she relies here on a classic distinction of phenomenology between an objective and a subjective body. Maybe one of the easiest ways to describe that is if I touch any part of my body right now, I'm going to have a double sensation. I'm going to be both the touching and the touched subject. So I, my body comes in my experience to me both as a material, physical um, object in the world, but also it is an experiencing lived body. Um, that involves a kind of sense of ownness or, or mindness. It is me. Um, and Young is essentially saying that the pregnant subject experiences her body and subjectivity as both her own and alienated. So the, um, the pregnant stomach essentially disrupts what we might call the habitual body. So the habitual lived body is this kind of experiencing body. And through this, we usually navigate the world really skillfully. It's underpinned by what some call a body schema, which is kind of comes out of our awareness of our body uh, in space and proprioception and kinesthetic sensations and the sense of ownness and mindness. And the pregnant stomach now disrupts this habitual lived body. It kind of brings the object body to the forefront of attention and warrants new ways of moving. Young gives the example of bumping into a table um, with because her body just she doesn't she isn't quite sure yet where where her body um, ends as it's changing. There are others who say that maybe the subjectivity in pregnancy is not necessarily split. So for example, Sarah Heinemann suggests that in pregnancy, the person actually retains a general sense of a bodily, I can move, um, that however, pregnancy involves a kind of new embodied habituation. We might think of it as like, there's like a normal pregnant embodiment, uh, big, big air quotes on that, but that it's not just a pathology of um, regular ways of being embodied, but a kind of specific pregnant embodiment. Um, so that's sort of the first two parts of Nelson's experience. Um, I'm gonna, 
<clears throat> I want to look a little bit more about uh, the experience of alienation now. So she's um, sometimes people who are pregnant kind of report how the body moves in ways that are not fully decided upon by you, which disrupts this kind of um, motor intentionality, this idea of a bodily I can, this habitual body that is outwardly directed at the world. And so to understand this a bit more, I'm going to look at um, the relations between pregnant subject and fetus. Hold on. Sorry, my um, PowerPoint just froze. Um, apologies for that. Um, yeah, okay, so um, Young's account of split subjectivity leads to, according to Sarah Heinemann, an unacceptable phenomenological contradiction. The idea that my body is me, yet not me, is really weird and strange. Um, Young posits here a kind of fusion account, so she's saying that the pregnant subject effectively can't distinguish between themselves and the fetus. But Heinemann suggests that this sense of minus or onus is retained, even though it kind of contours and um, even though the boundaries and, and contours of the lived body are shifted and changed. <clears throat> and one of the main problems here is that um, much of classic phenomenology and feminist phenomenology um, posits that intersubjectivity or self other relations is something that can happen only after birth, which disregards the potential relations between pregnant subject and fetus. And so Heinemann says that actually there are radically intimate relations between someone who's pregnant and the fetus, that they are kind of a couple that is characterized by a non-symmetrical codependency and a one-directional bounteousness. Um, we can think of it like this. So if I usually have a double sensation, when I place my hand on my stomach, for example, and both the touch and the touching thing, that's not the same as when I experience a fetus moving. That's just touching me. I'm, I'm not doing the touching. Although the touching of the fetus itself is mediated by the mother's flesh. So that's where the kind of non-symmetry comes up. In a similar line of thought, um, Jane Lima argues that pregnant subjectivity is not split, but rather is a coupling and extending of subjectivity and intentionality. And she draws here on an example by uh, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, where he talks about how things can get incorporated into a body schema. So he gives the example of a woman, it's very outdated, but a woman wearing a large hat with a, with a hat feather, and she's walking through a doorway, and without reflecting on it, without needing to stop and kind of look at the door, she's able to move her bodies in ways that the hat feather doesn't touch anything um, on the door. And this is because the hat feather has essentially become incorporated into her body schema. She's bodily aware of where it is. And Jane Lima is essentially saying that the fetus becomes incorporated into the maternal body schema in similar ways. So the difference maybe is that it's more reciprocal. So the maternal body also elicits and molds fetal movement and by extension, finally, the fetal body schema, um, whereas but mother's um, possibility for movement doesn't depend on the fetus. So yeah, to kind of summarize that, um, according to a phenomenology of pregnancy, this entails a disruption to the habitual body and alienation yet radical intimacy with the body, a relearning of the habitual body and a transformation of maternal and fetal body. And so to answer Nelson's question, I think we can say yes, pregnancy is a queer bodily experience. So Sarah Ahmed says that queer is a deviation from a straight line and orientation. And the pregnant body, which disorients, which disrupts the normal, queers normal embodiment, effectively. And I think that this understanding has uh, ramifications for approaches in queer theory, basically. So Nelson herself plays with references to Bazani and Edelman. She says that partly um, her pregnancy kind of let her assimilate into normalcy because with her pregnant body she 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 just looked like a very normal woman um and it had this kind of strange as she puts it seduction of normalcy that she um was interpreted by others in this way so we might ask whether um a pregnancy even 
someone when it's a queer person who is pregnant is just a, a form of homonormativity right it is queer but it's not really um radical um i just don't think that's quite right. I think that understanding pregnancy as a queer bodily experience, as I have tried to um, show now, gives us new options. Um, so some have challenged reproductive futurity through pregnancy by suggesting, for example, that um, <coughs> pregnancy has no futurity because the womb is a grave, similar to um, Bassani's suggestion that the rectum is a grave because as Nelson describes there's kind of a shattering of subjectivity that happens when you're pregnant um, and that as this is a paper by Collins in 2019 who writes that um, kind of Nelson's experience of pregnancy posits an embodied experience of pregnancy and childbirth as queer praxis in this um, shattering um, in a different paper, I, I found the suggestion that actually maybe pregnancy itself, um, whether or not it is queer, is, is something that is, doesn't necessarily relate to a reproductive futurity. So she draws on um, the film Arrival, in which the um, protagonist chooses to become pregnant, even though she has some uh, awareness of the future and know that her child will die. So we can't really speak of a, of a clear futurity there. I want to take a slightly different route and challenge um, this reproductive futur futurism by looking at queer utopia. So um, Munoz, Jose Esteban Munoz has um, suggested that queerness rejects the here and now, that it insists on new worlds, that it constitutes a reforming of sociality, relationships, intimacy, and the fabric of society. So he cons considers queerness a horizon of utopian possibility, not a utopia itself, but rather this, um, this thing that we, you know, we can work towards, but never really will grasp. Um, and I think one of the interesting things there is that queer negativity, as proposed, for example, by Edelman or Bersani, um, goes hand in hand with a focus on negative affect in a lot of queer theory, queer activism, and everyday queer experience. And I'm referring here to discussions of, of shame, stigma, discrimination, pain, and trauma, which are undoubtedly really important aspects of queer experience and really politically mobilizing aspects. Um, but I think they don't quite tell the full story. Um, happiness is, according to Sarah Ahmed, something that is unreachable for queer people where it, because it's only really something achieved um, in collaboration with state sanctioned lives. So she, she's very critical of the very notion of happiness and suggests that the promise of happiness is the promise of that of a fluid identity. And I think that actually maybe queer joy can be found in an embrace of deviance, in queer community, in queering queerness itself by embracing this kind of fluid and permeable identity. So the notion of joy as an act of resistance is something that's really prevalent. Um, I mean, first of all, it's something that's really overused today, um, today but it still perseveres in the writing of, um, for example, black feminism um, in the sense that, so in the uses of the erotic, Audre Lorde implies a queering of joy in making space to share joy with those who are other and locates joyfulness, not in securing the future of any particular identity or group, but rather using joy to open up a futurity in which people are valued in being other. And in that sense, this creation of new lines to use Sarah Ahmed's language and shamelessly rejecting heteronormative social rules is a kind of queer utopian project. Um, Ahmed does feature a notion of, of queer joy in her work and sort of says that the very act of describing queer gatherings as family gatherings is to have joy in the uncanny effect of a familiar form becoming strange. So queer or queer joy is then one that kind of really is open not to futurity in a straight line sense, but to expanding that to, to, to others. And I think that queer or oh, pregnancy in, this, in its queerness acknowledges these messy and uncanny aspects um, of futurity and reproduction. Right, and a kind of final note, um, I quickly want to look towards more ways in which the, the changing body is queer, I guess. Um, so Judith Butler um, writes that constraining gender norms work to subdue exercise of gender freedom. And she suggests that, well, 
not she necessarily, but queerness necessarily violates these norms because um, these norms are defined in relation to heterosexuality. And so she writes that um, a fall from established gender boundaries initiates a sense of radical dislocation. So this kind of gender dislocation is a moment where we realize that gender is not a necessity. This is not usually pleasant because it entails social rejection and so on. But I want to think for a moment about what happens for those for whom gender dislocation is a, an experience that comes to you know, accompany um, their, their life, right? So for example, queer people will necessarily encounter gender dislocation. Um, and for those for whom that is a very frequent occurrence that might have been affirmative for queerness, um, it might be really difficult um, to be pregnant because pregnancy is a kind of gender locating thing. It affirms stereotypical womanhood. Um, and this is something that Epstein writes about um, that butch mothers um, report renegotiating what it means to be queer when they're pregnant. So in that line of thought, I was really struck by another quote from Nelson where she writes, you pass as a guy, I as pregnant, our waiter cheerfully tells us about his family, expresses delight in ours. On the surface, it may have seemed as though your body was becoming more and more male, mine more and more female. But that's now not how it felt on the inside. On the inside, we were two human animals undergoing transformations beside each other. What she does here is um, kind of putting next to each other two changing bodies her changing body that is pregnant, and then her partner's uh, changing body who is transitioning. And she uses this notion of passing to describe both of them, but this is at the first, in the first moment, kind of a little bit um, odd because her partner is, is not a man. They identify, um, and I quote, as a butch on tea. So they are passing, they are not really a guy, but she really is pregnant. And I suggest that this um, juxtaposition of passing here points us towards how she knows that although she comes across as kind of assimilating into um, a heteronormative reproductive futurity, she knows from the inside that her pregnancy is this kind of queer mess. Um, and I think in that sense, the queerness of pregnancy can be something affirming to, to queer people who struggle with the um, normative as aspect of it. Yeah, to quickly summarize before we get into discussion, which I'm really looking forward to, um, queer pregnancy is a, what I'm trying to argue is that pregnancy is a queer bodily experience in that it queers normal embodiment. And I think as such, the queerness of pregnancy challenges no future approaches in queerness. Thank you. Thank you so much. A silent applause for Catherine. Uh, all right, so before we let everyone uh, on the floor, I was going to ask if you, Balam and Catherine, have any questions to each other. <laughs> yeah, I do. Um, but do you want to go first or? Yeah. Okay, no. I... Um, yeah, so I, I really enjoyed your presentation. I'm actually um, starting a PhD this summer where I'm looking at basically a kind of critical feminist phenomenology of um, disability, specifically with relation to um, the use of prosthetic technologies. Um, and I'm relying on a lot of Tafer's work, for example. So this was fantastic. And I'm hoping that this is, is this a published paper or will it be maybe? It's not, um, it's not a published paper. <laughs> um, maybe, I don't know, maybe in the future. <laughs> in, in I, I just really, um, I'm looking forward to it. And I think it's, it's a really relevant um, concept. One thing I was um, thinking about just on the side note was, um, if I understand you correctly, or rather like maybe one of the problems um, in, in Edelman's work is that he takes, the, when he's talking about the death drive, right? That he takes it almost in this metaphorical level. He's thinking about, okay, yeah, death is, is a reality for all of us, but in that he's kind of disregarding, and I think that's what you're criticizing also with the lack of intersectional approach, that death is also like a very active lived reality for some people, such as disabled people. Um, so I was just wondering yeah, if you wanted to say yeah, more about yeah. that. Yeah, I think so. I'm just sort of taking it on as sort of like a jumping board. I'm not very like interested in going too much into like his sort of like Lacanian and very complicated, like the symbolic and everything. Yeah, uh, yeah <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't really want to, I just like the provocation, the sort of like very, 
like the terroristic ways like oh, let's break this down and um let's embrace this thing so i just like that sort of um the performativity uh, that i get from it but yeah definitely it's very symbolic um and i really want to sort of create something that's uh, embodied and that sort of reckons with with the materiality of the lived body in mm -hmm. so like when i'm looking at temporalities i'm really thinking of embodiments as well and through embodiment that's why i sort of look at like um Kafer's treatment of um temporality and the disabled body which i couldn't get into which is uh, really fascinating but like in terms of your amazing presentation um I, I always find sort of like phenomenology to be very related to the sort of field of disability. Somehow they don't get together as much as I, I'd like them to. Like whenever I read works of phenomenology, I'm like, yeah, like this is so so similar to <laughs> like what I'm reading in disability studies and, and activism and somehow it doesn't work. But I, I especially like work about pregnancy and queerness, I immediately connected to disability as well, sort of like mm -hmm. the pregnant embodiment is both a queer embodiment totally, and also it's sort of like a disabled embodiment. And um, and of course I couldn't get into any of this stuff, but um, in, in a sort of like social understanding of, of disability, the social model of disability, not sort of just like a, um, a given or self-evident embodiment, but the way it's seen as being like more, in the, more dependent now, and the way people can sort of um, feel like they can intervene uh, in your life choices and the way it's sort of like, even when you're buying medication or alcohol, there's some note about pregnancy, disability and sickness, right? So they're sort of like <laughs> listed together as sort of like this vulnerable embodiment. So I, there are definitely connections there too. So, yeah. Yes, no, and I think that's that's great to bring out how, um, pregnant embodiment is is also in many ways kind of a disabled embodiment because pregnancy is something that massively um, affects people physically um, in 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 many different ways. Um, it's really dangerous actually to be pregnant, um, and it's also really interesting because a lot of people who, who are who are pregnant report that their body becomes a kind of public property, maybe even more so than it is for a lot of women in the first place, right? It's something that people have a lot of opinions on, um, that they that they touch and um, kind of, you know, want to control in ways that strike me very similar to the way we talk mm -hmm. um, and perceive disabled bodies as well. Yeah, definitely. All right, thank you guys. I'm sure you could go on forever, forever. Uh, having a very interesting discussion in front of us all. And as much as I'd love that, uh, I'd like to welcome some questions from the audience. Please just type your names in the chat if you want to ask a question. And uh, please begin it uh, by stating whether it's a question to uh, both of them or just uh, one of them. And in that case, who? So I, I noticed that Eric has a question. Please, Eric. Thank you. And thank you, Balam and Kat, for incredible presentations. I, this question is primarily to, to you, Balam. I was thinking uh, about um, if there is any possibility to think for Utopia or this, the type of temporality that you sketch from the perspective of a group. Um, it's, it's, um, mm -hmm. it's a thing I think I, it's problematic to me from the, uh, in regards to the presentation that I had this morning that, for example, Adorno and also Jameson, they insist that somehow utopia is also linked with a radical non-individuality. They use the term species from Marx, mm -hmm. basically, and I have a hard time sort of grasping exactly mm -hmm. how you should mm -hmm. think about it, but I also think that it is crucial because, of course, phenomenology and also theory around embodiment does center on the individual body, which at this historical moment is very much caught up with individuals. So basically, if there is a, an opening, an interesting opening towards the group, which also makes death much less of a certainty, of course, in connection mm -hmm. with cats, queer uh, pregnancy. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm always thinking of collectivities. I'm not um, thinking about individual. Of course, it's kind of like the the biggest irony is that my idea of utopia is about this white dude. <laughs> I just find this stuff really <laughs> interesting. But it's again, it's, it's a jumping board. But uh, I'm always thinking of collective affinities and collectivities. 
Um, and I think because um, Bob Flanagan was going through this in a very public way, um, and um, his performances were always sort of like very interactive and so on, um, and people reached out to him and he was taking part, like I said, in like children's camps with other sick children singing to them. And of course, he wasn't doing SNM <laughs> with them. Uh, but again, he was kind of perverting this idea. Um, and he was sort of like repurposing songs and, and making them about sort of like the vulnerability of, of CF and like these fluids um, that, that come out and everything. And it has the same kind of like very humorous connection with, with um, death and disability. It's just about surviving and surviving well in that moment, um, like uh, Makur says about uh, Flanagan's, uh, Flanagan's work. But yeah, I'm always thinking of, of Perptopia as a collectivity, which doesn't necessarily override the individual. Um, so um, for instance, you said like the species being that Marx has in mind um, and Marx's theory of need, I think is very instructive in the sense because he's both, he thinks on many registers and levels and he's thinking of like this very systemic thing, but then there's the idea of needs, which is very also individualized at the same time. But if you politicize needs as Nancy Fraser um, does in, in her work, um, then they become much more substantial and substantive than something like rights, for instance. So there's a way in which um, we can think of collectivities and then we can think about needs, which is what, I think disability studies uh, also brings sort of for when it um, sort of um, thinks about embodiment so much that we're, we're thinking about needs. And um, these needs are not special, but they're basic, right? Um, access needs are basic and it should be universal and it should be default. Uh, so in that sense, I think um, sort of politicizing needs, disability needs, vulnerability needs, all kinds of needs um, has the potential to connect, I think, collectivities with very individualized um, situations. I don't know if that makes sense, but um, yeah, your question made me think of those. Thanks for asking. Your presentation was awesome, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and I now give the word to Patrick. Uh, thank you. Um, my question actually is to both Kat and Balan. Um, but it's connected with something in Balan's presentation regarding the death drive, because uh, because it it made me think about how the closer that we get to death, the more kind of uh, universal our experience of life uh, probably comes to, to scale. For example, if I reflect on my life, I don't reflect on my identity per se. I, I reflect on the experiences that I've had that have kind of meant the most to me. Uh, so for example, kind of like kicking a soccer ball or like holding my cat or being with somebody I love watching a movie crying. And there's nothing in, in those experiences that are necessarily gendered as far as I can tell. Um, and so anyway, so it seemed like that you both had said at some point in your presentation that that queerness uh, was seen, is seen still as a threat to heteronormative society. Um, but this could be looked at as, a, as actually a good thing when we consider the society, society as a whole and, and uh, highlight the, the harm that it does to many different types of people. Uh, so in terms of this, uh, comment on the death drive and disability um, and the closer that we get to death the more our experiences can be kind of universalized I, I was just curious if you if you found anything in the philosophy of medicine for example uh, that utilized phenomenology or something about this type of experience as a way to um, as kind of bridge this gap between these two these multiple types of societies and kind of to compose it into something that's that's much more universal much more accepting I, sorry, can I clarify when you mean what, sure. what two types of society do you um, are, you mean? Oh, okay, uh, like a heteronormative society or other. Yeah, all right. Um, I can take a stab at this question because sure. it would raise a lot of big things first if you want, Balam. Um, and um, you're touching on a lot of things there, so it's, I'm kind of trying to figure out where to <laughs> start and answer, but maybe one way to think about it, especially in terms of disability, is um, so Alison Kafer 
um, in, in the book that Balam mentioned, Feminist um, Queer Crip, one of her big sort of overarching arguments is a criticism of the idea that when we are talking about utopias, that they are sort of one shared goal of all. Like we take that as something kind of for granted, right? That for example, and she 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 looks towards um, a feminist utopia novel um, and points out that in this novel, disability is virtually eradicated. Like it doesn't exist any longer. And she's, she's criticizing the fact that um, a lot of the time we talk about utopias um, as for example, no longer, you know, if there's no, there's no suffering and pain in it, uh, in it, and you know, disability therefore doesn't exist because that's all it is. It's just suffering and pain. Um, and so I think when it comes, for example, to the phenomenology of medicine um, as offering insights in that, we're really, we're kind of really struggling because the medicalized view of disability um, doesn't really consider how how much of the struggles of disability are like created by by the, those around us and by social forces and political structures rather than um by the experiences themselves um yeah so i think maybe hmm. i think there's um something to be said about how general okay Kind of coming at this from a different angle. Um, what is interesting, maybe, about um, Balan and my presentation today, and I think some of the other ones that we are going to see tomorrow, is that utopia can can become this kind of thing we discuss, for example, in as we've seen in literature and in economics and so on, as this abstract concept. But it also has very real ramifications for people because utopias are, are normative, right? There are people who who belong in them and people who don't. And I guess, yeah, I guess the the tension is then that that queerness is trying at least sort of the Monyo side of it, is trying to think about how we can have utopias where, where all where queer people and disabled people also belong. Um, yeah. I'm gonna unfortunately have to cut you short there. Uh, thank you for that brilliant last remark that utopias are always normative. And that's one of the things from uh, this conversation that's really gonna stay with me at least. So uh, could we please have a uh, final round of silent applause for both Cat Fisher and Balam Kenta. Thank you so much. And now I give the word to uh, Vladimir, who's going to present our keynote for the day. Thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, I would like to thank Balam and Kat for this wonderful presentation and the, what, and, and the wonderful discussion, which was really inspiring. Having said that, I feel like it's the time to move on and give the word to our keynote speaker, uh, Professor Rastislav Dinic, who is an associate professor in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Nish, which is in Serbia. And um, his interests lie in the fields of ethics and political philosophy, as well as the philosophy of Stanley Cowell. Um, he writes on politics and popular, popular, popular culture for the, for the site Peshanik which is a pretty big deal in Serbia. And another thing is that his topic is on what is realist in the capitalist realism. And in this topic, he will talk about the, the philosophy of Mark Fisher, as well as the philosophy of Cora Diamond. So without any further ado, I would like to give the word to Ratslav, Ratslav Nakas from our seats. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Vlado. Uh, now, I just wanted to ask you before I start: uh, uh, how will we uh, uh, how will we go about this uh, this presentation business? I have I have some slides that I would like to show uh, during my presentation. So, uh, should I just use the share screen button, right? Definitely, definitely. I think Patrick okay. has enabled everyone who has the spotlight to share. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Here it is. I think yes. So here we are. Let me just. <clears throat> okay. Excellent. So uh, can you see it? Great. Thank you. Yes. So I don't know about knocking anyone from their seats, but I'm going to uh, I'm going to try uh, to uh, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, Mark Fisher and his conception of uh, a cap uh, his concept of capitalist realism, and uh, I'm going to try to uh, 
connect this or to read this concept through the lens of uh, realism and the realistic spirit, which is a topic uh, that Cora Diamond has uh, dealt with in several of her essays and texts. And uh, I hope that the interesting thing is this, before I, before I start, I will try to, uh, so what, what was interesting for me is uh, uh, to notice uh, what seems to me a, a deep, a deep uh, uh, kinship between these two authors and between uh, these two strains of thought, which uh, previously, at least to my knowledge, have never, never been, uh, never been connected, or never been discussed together. Let me put it this way. So let me first say a thing or two about Mark Fisher, who is. Uh, a well-known author, at least in uh, 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 leftist circles. Uh, he died in 2017. Um, this is not usually something we do when we discuss uh, uh, philosophical authors, but there is something, for instance, in this photograph, there is something for me very, uh, 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 there is something that Cora Diamond calls uh, the difficulty of reality, right? It is very difficult for me to, to come to terms with the fact that Mark Fisher is dead. Uh, a person who, uh, 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 an author who uh, was not not only uh, active during my lifetime, uh, but who passed away definitely in his youth, before his time, and uh, also who was not uh, not just uh, active, but uh, very much alive, very much alive in the uh, uh, in the public sphere, not not just as an academic, but also as a critic. Uh, as a person who uh, uh, dealt uh, actively with uh, issues of political, of, uh, of popular culture and uh, music, television, and so on and so on. Uh, during his lifetime, uh, Fisher didn't have a, a, a huge uh, academic output, but he wrote a lot uh, on his blog and he had, he had several, several books of essays most famous being uh, capitalist realism, which we are going to discuss today. But he was always kind of straddling this line between uh, between uh, uh, academic writing, theoretical writing on the one hand, and uh, popular writing on the other. Uh, when people discuss Fisher, they often, in, in biographies, there was a huge output after his death on, on uh, Fisher, on his writing, and on his life. And many people have uh, rightly stressed uh, the fact that he was influenced a lot by, by uh, different kinds of literature, uh, uh, not just academic literature, not just, uh, 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 not just artistic literature, but, uh, uh, but for instance, uh, music criticism, the fact that uh, uh, the stuff you could, musical reviews, the stuff that you could find in, in uh, magazines such as NME, which uh, he was an avid reader of. <clears throat> and this is a, a specific kind of literacy. When we, think of, uh, when we think of readers, of people who read regularly, we primarily think of people who read uh, uh, high literature, right? Or who read uh, uh, philosophy or theory and so on. But there is, and uh, this is something that Fisher was, uh, was re has repeatedly come back to in his own writing. There is this wide readership, uh, of, or at least there used to be this wide readership uh, consisting of people who love music, love popular culture. And uh, there, were, there, were these, there was this whole scene or this whole public consisting of people who wrote for this, for this, for this kind of forums, right? And uh, this is in close proximity with something that uh, Mark Fisher uh, called popular modernism, right? He believed that there was this in the 70s, in the 80s through pop music, and then again through these forums, which, uh, which were uh, composed around it, there was a kind of popular modernism, a modernism for the masses, right? And uh, uh, modernism in the sense that it offered uh, 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 promises of, of what modernism in, in high culture uh, was uh, ready to offer this kind of transformative experience, but also it was, it was uh, uh, capable of addressing 
of addressing the masses, of addressing huge numbers of people. It wasn't elite, it wasn't elitist in this sense. So uh, Fisher was a philosopher by, by training and he has done his PhD in philosophy, but first he's, uh, he's not most famous for, for writings in, in, uh, in, in the field of uh, academic philosophy. And uh, also his background in philosophy was mostly in this kind of continental, expectedly this kind of continental philosophy like uh, uh, Deleuze and Guattari and Frederick Jameson and uh, Zizek and Lacan and so on and so on. And uh, uh, what I propose to do is to try to read his most famous concept through the lens of, uh, uh, let's say, Anglo-Saxon, in the wider sense, analytic philosopher such as Cora Diamond, although uh, when we deal with, with figures such as Diamond, we we have to face uh, uh, we have to face the fact that uh, this uh, this uh, this binary this binary division between analytic and continental philosophy might not be the best uh, the best way right to to uh, to read them through. So, what is capitalist realism? Uh, I'm going to start with the most famous definition. Uh, of this uh, concept, but uh, bearing in mind, and I ask all of you to bear in mind that it is, uh, Fisher never never offers this as a definitive definition, right? He, this is like the most popular, the most popular uh, uh, version of the concept. And this is, uh, this is what is often quoted in popular text. But uh, what Fisher does is actually return to the concept throughout throughout the essay and uh, give different angles or different examples of what of what uh, capitalist realism consists in so it is not uh, it is not that uh, we are dealing with uh, with a definition we are we are dealing with uh, different kinds different texts on what uh, this complex uh, concept might con might consist in so let's let's start from this from this uh, basic definition. He says, uh, watching children of men, we are inevitably reminded of the phrase attributed to Frederick Jameson Slavoj Žižek, that it is easier to imagine the end of the world than it is, uh, uh, than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. Just a moment. That slogan captures precisely what I mean by capitalist realism. The widespread sense that not only is capitalism the only viable political and economic system, but also that it is now impossible even to imagine a, coher a coherent uh, alternative to it. So the bold text is what is usually cited as, uh, as the typical definition or the most famous definition of capitalist realism that, uh, that uh, Fisher offers in his work. So uh, here he references the film Children of Men, uh, which was popular at the time. It was relatively new at the time still. And uh, what is interesting for Fisher in this film is that uh, it is a dystopia. It is a dystopic, a dystopic science fiction film. But this dystopia is not uh, a, a dystopia which is, uh, is not a dystopia which includes a radical break from our reality, right? It is more like uh, more like uh, exaggerated uh, uh, reality we already live in, right? And uh, this is what is stunning about this film for uh, for Fisher that uh, for to see our uh, to see our reality as dystopic, we only need to exaggerate certain features of the reality we already live in. Uh, the main premise of the film and the book that it was uh, filmed, uh, that it was based in, based on, is uh, that suddenly for, uh, without, uh, uh, without uh, clear reason or without clear cause, uh, uh, children uh, have stopped being bo born anywhere in the world. So there are no more children, right, in the world. And uh, the film, starting from this premise, the film tries to build a kind of realistic dystopia based on this premise. So as I said, uh, Fisher does not 
offer uh, the previous uh, uh, sentence as as a definitive definition of capitalist realism. So let's see. Let's go through different examples where he tries to uh, to uh, illuminate the concept better through through different instantiations. For instance, when he uh, connecting to the discussion of the children of men. He says this, it is evident that the theme of sterility, the theme of sterility in the children of men must be read metaphorically as a displacement of another kind of anxiety. I want to argue this anxiety cries out to be read in cultural terms. And the question the film poses is, how long can a culture persist without the new? What happens if the young are no longer capable of producing surprises? Children of men connects with the suspicion that the end has already come. The thought that it could well be the case that the future harbors only reiteration and repermutation. Could it be that there are no breaks, no shocks of the new to come? Although uh, here Fisher doesn't offer, uh, uh, doesn't use the term cancellation of the future later in his later writings, he's going to use it in conjunction with capitalist realism and in order to illuminate it further. So this is his one of his main theses about capitalist realism. So capitalist realism is a, a, a kind of crisis of imagination and a crisis of a future. And it is also a cancellation of the future. Basically, we are unable to imagine future different than the one that we already live in. Children of Men, the movie, is just the illustration of this crisis, right? The exaggeration of this crisis are a metaphor for this crisis. Sterility in this movie is a metaphor for this crisis. What else is capitalist realism? So Fisher says, realism itself. The power of capitalist realism, he writes, derives in part from the way that capitalism subsumes and consumes all of pre previous history. One effect of its system of equi equivalence, which can assign all cultural objects, whether they're religious iconography, pornography, or das Kapital, a more monetary value. Walk around the British Museum, where you see the objects, where you see objects torn from their, their life worlds and assembled as if on, on the deck of some predator scape, uh, spacecraft, and you have a powerful image of this process at work. In the conversion of practices and rituals into merely aesthetic objects, the beliefs of, of previous cultures are objectively ironized, transformed into artifacts. Capitalist realism is therefore not a particular type of realism. It is more like realism it, in itself. What does this mean? So basically this is uh, here, uh, Fisher is expanding on on uh, on famous Marxist thought, right? That capitalism turns everything into thin air, right? And uh, uh, the point is that capitalism not only, uh, 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 as we uh, mentioned in the previous uh, uh, just a moment ago, not only cancels the future, but it actually uh, uh, turns the past kind of flattens the past, right? He, it turns everything that remains from the past, the cultural artifacts, the art, the practices, the whole life world into this kind of exchangeable value, right? This is the famous Marxist phrase. In this sense, it is realism itself because it shows, and we will return to this, that behind every cultural practice, everything that we held in special value, everything that we held uh, that had special standing in uh, in human society, uh, practices, religions, um, uh, uh, cultural artifacts, and so on, uh, is actually uh, reducible reducible to its uh, to its uh, financial value. So, in the, in fact, there is there is no other. Real, it is realism itself because it uh, uh, it uncovers the reality be behind all these sacral, uh, 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 sacralized objects or sacralized practices. And this, and this reality is its exchange value. So connected to this or directly stemming from this is what else is capitalist realism? Desacralizing culture, right? Or demystifying culture, looking behind culture. So culture is just 
a set of economic practice. Capitalism is what is left when beliefs have collapsed at the level of ritual or symbolic elaboration. And all that is left is the consumer spectator trudging through the ruins and the relics. What else is capitalist realism? And here we come to the important point. Uh, uh, in short, it is a protection, uh, as we will see, Fisher says, it is a shield protecting us from, from belief. And uh, as I wrote here, it is a protection from fanaticism, terror, and totalitarianism. In what sense? In claiming, uh, Fisher writes, as Badiou puts it, to have delivered us from the fatal abstractions inspired by the ideologies of the past, capitalist realism present, presents itself as a shield protecting us from the perils posed by belief itself. The attitude of, of ironic distance proper to postmodern capitalism is supposed to immunize us against the seductions of fanaticism. Lowering our expectations, we are told, is a small price to pay for being protected from terror and totalitarianism. So here we have this. This is also not a new thought at this point. So capitalist realism. Uh, uh, contains are uh, uh, a part of capitalist realism is this kind of postmodern irony toward different kinds of grand, grand narratives and different kinds of beliefs, right? So basically, we are immunized, as uh, Fisher says, against uh, against uh, terror and totalitarianism, against fanaticism through ironizing beliefs, right? Through ironizing. Any kind, uh, uh, any kind of belief in a grand narrative about about changing society are building a different society. Very close, closely connected to this is a comparison Fisher uh, offers a very deep and important for him personal important comparison uh, that capitalist realism is a deflationary or depressive perspective. Quoting Badiou, who says, sure, they say, we may not live in a condition of per perfect goodness, but we are lucky that we don't live in a condition of evil. Our democracy is not perfect, but it's better than the bloody di dictatorships. Capitalism unjust, is unjust, but it's not criminal like Stalinism. We let millions of Africans die of AIDS, but we don't make racist nationalist declarations like Milosevic. We kill Iraqis with our airplanes, but we don't cut their throats with machetes like they do in Rwanda, etc. This is quote. Uh, this is Fisher quoting Badiou. And here is uh, here is the uh, uh, Fisher's summary. The realism here is analogous to the deflationary perspective of a depressive who believes that any positive state, any hope, is a dangerous illusion. So basically, one of the ways that we can define capitalist realism is as a perspective which uh, uh, is distanced from any kind of hope, which repudiates any kind of hope. We are reading this as, of course, when it is, comes to capitalist realism, uh, we're talking about political or political economic hope for a different kind of system. But uh, Fisher draws a comparison to uh, individual psychologic uh, uh, state of depression, right? And a state that he was suffering throughout his life uh, from, and uh, a, a state which he tried to politicize, uh, to read in a kind of soci sociopolitical context as one of the possible, one possible uh, uh, consequence or a symptom of capitalist realism. Now, here's a question. Uh, if uh, capitalist realism is so similar to postmodernism, and if he already quotes Frederick Jameson and calls upon Frederick Jameson and his, uh, his definition uh, of uh, the postmodern state, right? Uh, the question uh, Fisher poses is, why do we need a new concept? Why capitalist realism and not simply postmodernism, as Frederick Jameson would say? And he offers three reasons why not, or why we need the new concept. The first 
is uh, that in the in the 80s when Jamieson first uh, advanced his thesis about postmodernism, there were still in in name at least political alternatives to capitalism. So the 80s was the time of really existing socialism, when really existing socialism still existed, where there were still at least in name socialist societies. Today, that is no longer the case. Second uh, uh, reason is that, as he says, postmodernism involved some relationship to modernism. And on the other hand, capitalist realism takes the vanquishing of modernism for granted. So uh, postmodernism was still in dialogue with modernism. It was still a twist on, on modernism and on modernist premises and modernist promises. And uh, you know, when it comes to capitalist realism, it already it already uh, dealt away. It has already dealt away with with modernist promise. And the modernist promise is remember a promise of radical transfiguration, right? Both of the individual and and of society. Finally, and connected with the first uh, uh, with the first uh, reason, but subtly different. Uh, whole generation has passed since the collapse of the Berlin Wall. For most people under 20 in Europe and North America, the lack of alternatives to capitalism is not no longer even an issue. So not only is uh, uh, there no, uh, uh, no more alternative to capitalism, are, uh, no, uh, not only is it that we are dealing as Branko Milanovic, a political economist, uh, says in his latest book, not only are we dealing with capitalism alone, but uh, but the memory of the alternatives uh, is is uh, quickly quickly uh, fading from view or fading from memory. New generations uh, do not have an experience with with uh, uh, with with alternatives to capitalism. Do not even remember a world where uh, capital, capital where the alternatives existed. Uh, so as uh, Fisher notes. Uh, Jameson used to report in horror about the ways that capitalism had seeped into the very unconscious. Now, the fact that capitalism had, had, has colonized the dreaming life of the population is so taken for granted that it is, uh, that it is hardly worthy of comment. So, what is the problem with capitalist realism? Uh, uh, or how, how, how could we push against capitalist realism. Uh, one one uh, route is, of course, as usually, uh, as is usually the case, we can uh, always uh, uh, offer some kind of uh, moral criticism of capitalist excesses, right? But Fisher is not in the business of, of moral criticism. And he claims that he, he says this, the main problem with capitalist realism is uh, uh, that it is not realist enough, or not realist in the proper way. Uh, we will see. I will try to answer or to deepen this answer uh, when when we when we start talking about Cora Diamond and her version of, of realism. So basically, capitalist realism actually misses actually misses uh, uh, realism. Uh, uh, it aims for it claims to aim for for realism for for being devoid of illusions, right? And. Uh, 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 as any depressive is devoid of illusions, as Fisher notes, but it misses it misses the realist picture, the real picture of uh, of the condition we are in. A moral critique of capitalism, Fisher writes, uh, emphasis, emphasizing the way in which it leads to suffering, only reinforces capitalist realism. Poverty, famine, and war can be presented as an inevitable part of reality, while the hope that these forms of suffering could be eliminated, easily painted is naive utopianism. Capitalist realism can only be threatened if it is shown to be in some way inconsistent or untenable. If that is to say, capitalism's, capitalism's ostensible, ostensible realism turns out to be nothing of the sort. Now, I would like to give uh, uh, an example of how, uh, uh, especially of this connection between depression and capitalism, uh, capitalist realism, which will be important later on. Uh, uh, although uh, uh, capitalist realism is uh, the main topic of, of uh, 
of, of uh, the essay of the same name. Uh, Fisher has been developing the con uh, this concept throughout his later work. And uh, sometimes it is best, since it, he is best when he deals with, with the things he loves most. And it is uh, uh, when, he deals, when he deals with music criticism, when he writes about the stuff he loves most, uh, uh, it is here that the concept really comes alive. So for instance, he, uh, he writes about Joy Division, the band that shaped him and that shaped his uh, worldview and so on, that me meant a lot to his generation, right? He's a, a, a working class uh, uh, Englishman from the, that grew up in the, in the beginning of the 80s. Uh, just like uh, in, the, in the midst of the popularity of Joy Division. So, but he reads Joy Division as a kind of, uh, as, as uh, uh, the phrase, would, uh, as the phrase goes, as a, as a canary in the coal mine, right? As um, artists who in a way sensed what was starting to happen, who sensed the changing, the changing of the epochs, right? The, are the changing of, uh, uh, of uh, ideological hegemony. And this is what he said, this is the most important uh, part. He says, if joy division matter now more than ever, it's because they capture the depressed spirit of our times. Listen to uh, joy division now, and you have the inescapable impression that the group were catatonically channel or channeling our present, their future. So he believes that the depressed, uh, what, uh, what made Joy Division so original and what, uh, and also what, uh, uh, what uh, 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 their fandom shared in uh, uh, was basically this overwhelming sense of, uh, of canceling the future, right? Of the, new, of the new age coming, the new age of neoliberal, neoliberal age in which uh, the promises, as he says, the promises of youth culture, the promises of popular modernism that I already mentioned, the promises that of radical transformation are going to be canceled, right? They're, they're suddenly being canceled. And everything you see in front of you is just this desert, right? Uh, so what he says is from, from the start, their work was over overshadowed by a deep foreboding, a sense of a future foreclosed. All certain, certainties dissolved, only growing gloom ahead. It has been increasingly clear that 1979, 1980, the years with which the group will always be identified was a threshold moment. The time when a whole world, social democratic, Fordist, industrial, became obsolete. And the contours of a new world, neoliberal, consumerist, informatic, be began to show themselves. So in commenting on Joy Division, uh, he says, he adds this, give their earliest songs a casual listen and you could easily mistake their tone for the curled lip of spiky punk outrage. But already it is as if Curtis is not railing against injustice or corruption so much as marshalling them as evidence for a thesis that was even then firmly established in his mind. Depression is after all and above all a theory about the world, about life. The stupidity and venality of politicians dealt with in the song Leaders of Men, the idiocy and cruelty of war are pointed to, are pointed to as exhibits in a, case against the, in a case against the world, against life. That is so overwhelming, so general, that to appeal to any particular instance seems superfluous. So Fisher's point here is that with Joy Division and with this depressive perspective that he uh, that he recognizes uh, uh, as a symptom as a symptom of capitalist realism, we are not dealing anymore with criticism, with uh, criticism of certain features of the world, not uh, with reformism, not even with some kind of revolutionary uh, cry for revolutionary, much less with a cry of, for revolutionary uh, change, or the revolutionary upheaval are a radical change of the system. The point is that when you, uh, when you uh, as he says, uh, as you gather evidence, that you're gathering evidence against the world itself, against life itself. Everything is, everything is bad, right? Everything is bad. And not, not only is everything bad, but there are so much evils, there is so much hypocrisy, so much moral corruption in the world that uh, there is nothing else, no, nothing else to do about it. Actually, 
the, this depressionist theory about life consists in the fact that we are uh, uh, we are capable of recognizing this truth, right? What is the realism of depression? Exactly this, that we can see behind, we can see, this is this Schopenhauerian insight that we can see beside, uh, behind, uh, behind mere, mere, pres mere representations, right? Be behind this show of, uh, of culture and everyday life. And we can see that behind it, uh, uh, there is just this meaningless repetition. Right, meaningless repetition of the will. Their subject, after all, uh, Fisher writes, is depression, not, not sadness or frustration, rock standard downer states, but depression. Depression whose difference from mere sadness consists in its claim to have uncovered the final unvarnished truth about life and desire. For the repressive, the habits of the former life world now seem to be precisely a mode of play acting. A series of pantomime gestures, a circus complete with all fools, this is a quote, which they are both no longer capable of performing and which they no longer wish to perform. There's no point. Everything is a sham. Now, let me try to say something about uh, Cora Diamond and uh, her, her famous essay on realism and the realistic spirit. This is unlike, unlike Fisher's essay, which is popular, uh, it is eminently readable, it is aimed as, as the works of popularist, uh, popular modernism uh, are supposed to be at a wide, wider reading audience, not just at, a, at the philosophically educated one. Uh, Diamond's, Diamond's text is dense, academic, and requires uh, uh, a philosophical education. It deals with many different topics in this, uh, uh, um, in, a, in a very rich, uh, rich and uh, uh, complex, uh, complex way. And uh, uh, to do it justice, uh, there is no way to do it justice in, in a short presentation or short speech like this one, especially not when it is only used to uh, as a as a means to to analyze something else. But uh, uh, I will try to to uh, sketch uh, the main topic of the of the essay and the way I believe on the of the article and the way that it bears uh, upon our main topic. So basically, Diamond starts with a, a quote from Wittgenstein. And the quote says, not empiricism and yet realism in philosophy, that is the hardest thing. And beginning from this, uh, uh, from this quote, she tries to uh, analyze what, uh, to come to terms with what, uh, uh, what might be the properly realist approach to philosophy, right? And she develops uh, this conception, he, she uh, traces this uh, series of clashes inside philosophy, right? Of different philosophers with conceptions that they considered uh, to be not realist enough, right? To be uh, realist in the wrong way, to be uh, an attempt at realism, but, uh, but misguided attempts of, of, at realism. So basically, this is what Diamond says. The suggestion appears. Uh, the suggestion appears to be the suggestion of Wittgenstein's uh, quote that empiricism is something we get into in philosophy by trying to be realists, but going about it in the wrong way are not hard enough. Uh, Berkeley, this this is like the, the this uh, uh, series of different philosophical criticisms that she notes that are connected to this topic or that are connected uh, through which this train goes. Berkeley criticizes materialism in the name of the realistic spirit, of the proper realism, not on ontological realism, but of kind of being realistic about going, uh, uh, in going about philosophy. Frank Ramsey uh, goes against obscurantism in the name, like metaphysical obscurantism, in the name, again, in the name of the realistic spirit, again, a kind of reformed empiricism. And finally, Wittgenstein himself goes even against Ramsey and against empiricism 
in the name, again, in the name of the realistic spirit. So realistic spirit goes against different kinds uh, of uh, instantiations of realism or of these attempts uh, of realism, finding them to be lacking, to be, not be realistic enough. So realism, which is being criticized here, uh, is, uh, as uh, Diamond says, as Diamond notes following Berkeley, a model about language. So basically, uh, this is what she says. Take, for instance, the distinction between what there really is and what is merely chimerical, the topic, uh, like, right, the, the main topic of Berkeley's, a product of imagination or whatever. We are in a model about this distinction. We misrepresent it to ourselves. Uh, and one characteristic feature of the model, model is our belief that the distinction must depend on something beyond what we perceive. Berkeley's attempt to deal with the confusion has two parts, description and diagnosis, diagnosis as it were. The, the description is meant to show us that, exa uh, that exactly where we thought the distinction could not be made, it can be, and indeed it is. And the diagnosis aims to explain how the confusion arises from a fantasy of the way language itself works. So basically, if you remember in the three dial dialogues, uh, Berkeley deals uh, with, uh, with this ma uh, materialistic position, right? He confronts these two uh, interlocutors, Philonus and Hilas, and Hilas represents or uh, uh, supports this materialistic position. Hilas is be uh, convinced that he is the real realist. He is the real realist because he believes that there is something between mere perception, there is something between our, uh, uh, a mere representation, right? And that something is the real reality. And Berkeley's point, Philonus, which he puts in the mouth, of course, of, of the other in, uh, interlocutor of Philonus, is that whichever distinction we try to make between, between reality, what is real and what is just chim chimerical, what is real and what is just a fantasy is, uh, uh, is a distinction uh, that is already in our experience, right? So it is exactly, and the, the realist, the so-called realist, the materialist, Hillas, uh, disregarding our experiences, disregarding our, uh, our perceptions, misses exactly the field where distinctions between reality and fantasy should be drawn and can only be drawn. He, makes his enthrall of a, of a fantastical or of, of a fantasy himself. And this fantasy is that he can withdraw himself from perceptions and uh, from a kind of, from a, a point of view above all perceptions, see the difference between perceptions and reality. And Berkeley's point is, we never do that. We can never do that. But we can still draw differences between uh, relevant distinctions between reality and fantasy, and we draw it in our experience. This is where you draw it. These are this is where uh, this is these are the distinctions which matter. So the point is exactly by aiming at realism, but trying a, by trying to find a kind of hard uh, hard ground for our realism, we we miss the exactly the the ground where where uh, where we can draw relevant distinctions, when we, where we can make distinction between reality and fantasy. So this is how a certain type of realism uh, leads us astray, right? It leads us astray exactly from, from what, what it is intended, intended to, uh, to hit upon. And then there is another way that, uh, 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 that Diamond tries to uh, exemplify what she means by this kind of misguided realism. And this example is from Wittgenstein. And she says, uh, 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 she quotes two, two passages from Wittgenstein, from Wittgenstein's uh, philosophical investigations. So the first one says, in order to see more clearly, here is in countless similar cases, Wittgenstein is here talking about semantics, right? About, about meanings of words and about how, how we go about using language in our language games and how we are uh, often in, in a kind of positive, naively positivist uh, vision of philosophy of language, 
we are prepared to completely ignore the role uh, that uh, words play in, our, in ordinary language games and to try to find some kind of harder connection between, between words and things. And in this way, we falsify our relationship with language. But what he says can be applied much wider than uh, on the topic that he's dealing with. So he says, in order to see more clearly, here is in countless similar cases, we must focus on the details of what goes on, must look at them from close to. If I'm inclined to, to suppose that a mouse, a mouse has come into being by spontaneous generation out of gray rags and dust, I shall do well to examine those rags very closely to see how a mouse may have hidden in them, how it may have got there and so on. But if I'm convinced Convinced that the mouse cannot come into being from these things, that this investigation, then this investigation will perhaps be superfluous. But first we must learn to understand what it is that opposes such an, an examination of details in philosophy. So basically what Wittgenstein says, if you want, if you want to draw important lessons about the role, about uh, how, how words come to have meaning, how words signify, we should look at at our practices of work with words, in our life with words. But these are details of our everyday experience. This is important, right? But then there is a view, and this is the view that he's uh, uh, criticizing, which leads us to completely miss the details. And this is important. This is where the important distinctions are made. And this view says no mouse can come from the rags. No, uh, no uh, uh, understanding of how words signify can come from our ordinary practices with words. We need something stronger, something much more real, something behind our practices, right? The real, real. And this is the kind of realist, the realist pull behind this view, which, however, leads us completely astray and leads us in the dark about what can, uh, what can help us, what can help us draw relevant distinctions. I'm sorry about that. So basically, this is what Diamond says. The realistic spirit does not know so well that you cannot get a mouse. So uh, contrary to this kind of realism, uh, uh, which misses its mark is the realistic spirit, right? The realistic spirit, which does not uh, uh, project uh, a spe specific metaphysical view or ontological view of realism, but tries to go about philosophy in a realistic spirit by aiming uh, to, to avoid, by, by, uh, by avoiding mystifications, right? So basically what Diamond says, the realistic spirit does not know, uh, does does not then know so well that you cannot get a mouse from rags, that it will not look at the rags. What I'm suggesting is that Berkeley's aim is like Wittgenstein's, to show that philosophers miss the details, the rags that a philosophical mouse comes out of, because something has led them to think that no mouse can come out of that. This is what connects uh, otherwise quite different Berkeley's and Wittgenstein's positions, our arguments. Finally, there is something uh, uh, in this kind of realism, the view that she criticizes, uh, uh, which, is, uh, which goes against the muddy and untidy uh, everyday practices. Again, which are even more precisely that views everyday practices uh, as muddy and untidy. Berkeley conceives our state of mind here is more like less like this. What we are doing is not attending to our actual ways of telling what is real, which do not involve an idea of being real. We look past the variety of different ways of handling experiential data because we take ourselves to be onto something beyond it, beyond anything as muddy and as and untidy as that. A little later, the details appear irre irrelevant because we think we can make out something else, which if we, do, we did not have it, or at least believe that we did, would make pointless our actual practices of using evidence as we do in judging what is real. So basically, uh, this view uh, leaves us without resources to draw differences between, relevant differences between uh, uh, reality and fantasy, because in a way, 
it makes fantasy out of everything we do, out of all our practices, out of all of our distinctions. Mm -hmm. Just a moment. Okay. Uh, I'm going to try to shorten this so that we can have a discussion. Uh, so basically, the fantasy of, of, of philosophical realism is this. Our elementary realism, as we may call it, has at its heart the, the, that contrast between what is said, adhering to the practices, the conventions, governing the writing of saints' lives, and what the facts were. The philosophical realist attempts to take up a position analogous to that of elementary realism, but confusedly. The philosophical realist's conception of room for a position analogous to that of elementary realism, that is fantasy. Now, what Diamond is here talking about is she tries to, uh, uh, to explain how, how do we come into this fantasy? Why are we drawn into this fantasy? And uh, uh, she makes a, uh, makes, a com makes a comparison with elementary, what she calls elementary realism. Elementary realism is the view that draws us, for instance, to compare hagiographies, saints' lives, right, biographies of saints, but this kind of conventional biographies of saints, in which there are miracles, there are many things we know cannot really happen, right, but are matters of convention. They're matter of genre. That's, that's how the authors were writing hagiographies, right? You know, the saint that and that had different kinds of signs of his sainthood and so, but he hid them and so and so. So, but these are just matters of, of convention. And you can compare these, these narratives, which are fantastic, with real facts about the lives of persons who are considered saints. And you can say, okay, aha, uh -huh, some of these things are just not facts. You can compare these narratives to facts and say, this is what they lack uh, in, in regard of realism. But the philosophical re realist makes this realist uh, under commas, uh, makes this a mistake believing that you can do that with, with our perception, with our own experience, right? That our own experience is just like a kind of hagiography. You can just peer behind it and see the real reality. And that is the mistake. That is what leads us into fantasy. So let me wrap up. Uh, realism in philosophy, Diamond says, is the hardest thing. And by that, she means, so basically, when we when you strip all these previous attempts at, at realism, we come to this hardest thing, which is open-eyedly giving up the quest for an elucidation of different, of, of how we might mean what, what we say, right, as Kadal would say. So we give examples to others of what we mean. We may agree on these examples. But if we try some kind of hard guarantee uh, to find some kind of hard guarantee, ontological guarantee, uh, guaranteeing for, for our understanding the same words or going about with words, then there, we're going to fantasy. We're offering elucid elucidation, which, which is not offerable, which, which we cannot find, right? Realism in philosophy, the hardest thing is open-eyedly giving up the quest for such an elucidation. The demand that philosophical account of what I mean uh, make clear how it is fixed out of all possible continuations, out of some real semantic space, which I mean. Open idly, that is not just stopping, but with an understanding of the quest as dependent on fantasy. Uh, Diamond's uh, uh, article uh, ends with this kind of epic Graph, right? This is her style, right? Very Wittgensteinian style. She just she just throws this into the mix in the very end of her article. And she says, so what about realism in moral philosophy? Might one say, not utilitarianism, but still realism in moral philosophy? That is the hardest thing. It seems to me a question worth asking. Now, it is here, it is impossible to deal uh, or to analyze this thought. But there is a lot of in other Diamond's texts, which uh, illuminates what she might mean, right? And that is that utilitarianism is, seems to be, you know, this kind of harsh, hard realist way of going about morality, right? Because, you know, what is morality about? It's about consequences, right? Isn't it obvious? Everything else is just a mere fantasy, right? If you want to be realist about, about uh, morality, you have to be a utilitarian. This is, this is what moralism is about. 
This is the hard, the hard facts that moralism, these are the hard facts moralism is about. What else would it be about? But still, Diamond thinks that this is a kind of falsification, right? This is a falsification of morality, and this is a, a misguided way about uh, in go, of going about, in, uh, 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 about morality, right, in philosophy. Finally, in a different text, uh, uh, Diamond offers, um, uh, uh, deals with what she calls the difficulty of reality, the difficulty of dealing with some experiences which as uh, 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 using Cavell's phrase, shoulder us, shoulder us out of out of reality, right? And uh, uh, it, in these uh, situations, uh, we need uh, we need to kind of open-eyedly uh, confront the difficulty of these situations and not trying to, as she says, deflect them by uh, 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 by uh, subsuming them under simplistic. Uh, theoretical solutions like utilitarianism. And her example is, for instance, Elizabeth Costello, a character in uh, Kotz's, uh, uh, J.M. Kutz's famous, famous novel of the same name, who uh, sees factory farming, right, uh, the way we treat animals as akin to, holo to the Holocaust. And this leads her to a sense of moral isolation and even conflict with her interlocutors and her society, but this is such a strong, such a strong sense that sh she just cannot give up, right? And she tries to kind of open-eyedly, clear-eyedly face this horror the way that our society every day treats animals. The wrong way to go about it, uh, 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 as Diamond would say, would be to try to explain our problem with animals and the way we treat animals in a kind of utilitarian way. So what is realist in capitalist realism? I believe it is that which stops us from looking at the details, the rags of ordinary political organizing, the muddy and untidy practices of everyday judgment, our own feelings and intuitions, culture and art as a way of articulating a vision of different possibilities. What is what is the claim of capitalist realism? I would say something akin to this. Utopia cannot possibly come from that. That being human nature, our everyday, our everyday, our everyday ways of trying to create a, a different society, right? Of dealing with political, economic, moral issues, of trying to imagine a different society through different practices, through art, through culture, through political organizing, through trial and error, and so on. And uh, uh, capitalist realism tries to bypass all that and to say, behind all this is illusion. All this is ideological illusion. You are being naive, right? It tries to deflate our expectations, our hopes, and to say, there is a real reality behind our social life. And that re real reality tells us that no mouse can come from the rags. No utopia can come, can come from something, from a timber so crooked as, as our, our, our very nature, as our human nature. So let me stop here. I, I have some other things to say. Maybe I, I will be able to mention them in discussion. I'm sorry for taking up so much time. Thank you very much. Let's give a round of silent applause. And having said that, you guys know the procedure. If you have any questions, you can write them down in the chat box. That is to say, write down your name, and then you can, you can. Then I will, then I will call upon your your question. Having said that, the first question is from Alexa. What a surprise! <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, Professor, for the talk, and uh, it's always a pleasure to hear you uh, hold lectures and talks. I find them always so illuminating, forthcoming, direct. Um, so with that in mind, my question, of course, you have me completely convinced um, that what is real, quote unquote, real and capitalist realism can clearly have with in mind that, that everything that's been said can only be seen as a smokescreen for, uh, for and, and smokescreen that stops us from actually articulating ideas about different types of uh, utopias or different types of modes of existence or organizing political structures and life as such. So my question to you would be, 
what kind of thinkings or what, what kind of process of thinking can we uh, utilize uh, uh, to come up with an alternative to capitalism or specifically capitalist realism without going backwards? So without um, residing to some already known ideological structures or modes of existence or modes of practices, how can we come up with a somewhat new creative idea that would not call back on some of the historical heritage that shoulders us and burdens us uh, very often, especially when we try to think about alternatives to capitalism. That isn't to say that I don't think it is impossible. Actually, I believe it is very possible. But what would your thoughts be on this subject? Thank you. Uh, I think, uh, thank you, the great question. And of course, that's a million dollar, million dollar question, right? Well, how do we go about? But uh, first, there might there might not be a, a one recipe for all. It might not be a, a, a recipe at all, right? If you go about it in this way that uh, Diamond tries to do, go about uh, uh, her philosophy of, of, of mind and uh, philosophy of uh, language and also ethics, then what is important is kind of recognizing specific situations and, and how we respond to them. But uh, primarily at, to begin with, we should be open, we should open eye idly uh, face uh, uh, the fact that, uh, that uh, uh, the society we live in, institutions we live in, are, uh, are, are, are not, uh, uh, that we are not destined to them and that this is not the only possible reality. This might be a frightening, a frightening, uh, um, uh, a frightening perception, a frightening conclusion, right? This is a kind of conclusion that that uh, uh, Costello faces when she faces some horrible things about uh, uh, about herself, right, and about the way we treat animals. But um, uh, I would say I would say we, we have to do that. And uh, uh, there is one. There is okay, one example that I mentioned later in my in my presentation, but I'm not going to bore you bore you with that, uh, uh, which is uh, the way that Stanley Cavell answers uh, answers. Uh, he writes a letter to this famous uh, character right from Moliere's *Misanthrope*, and uh, the character is uh, Alceste, and uh, so he's this young man. Much like, uh, much like uh, uh, young Curtis, right, in the, the, the young man from, from Joy Division, uh, who is uh, bothered by our everyday hypocrisy, right, hypocrisy of our everyday practices, and who, like uh, Joy Division in their depression, depressed and deflationary perspective, try to gather, tries to gather all these, all these uh, accusations, uh, for all this, uh, he tries to build the case against the world and against life. And uh, Cavell gives him a suggestion, and uh, uh, how to get get himself out of this. Out of this, uh, Cavell has a lot of understanding for him, right? But he he gives him a, a, an advice, a piece of advice, how to get out of this state of mind, and at the same time, not not acquiesce to not acquiesce to uh, to uh, to hypocrisy. And his uh, his advice is. Uh, Watch Makavev, watch Dushan Makavev, watch Makavev, sweet movie. And Makavev, in which Makavev, who lives in socialist Yugoslavia, tries to reckon kind of open eyedly uh, 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 with, with uh, communist crimes, tries to come face to face with communist crimes, right? With crimes of, of communist revolution with which he still identifies. So this is a kind of this seems to me as a good uh, example of a re realistic spirit, a realistic spirit in in political philosophy. This is uh, what we're trying to find: this kind of realism, which is the hardest thing when when try to apply when we try to apply it to political philosophy. I don't know if this is the answer to your question. Yeah, I, th I think it suffices. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have my cell phone list now. Oh, which uh, which uh, which is actually related to the first section of your of your presentation. And having said that, I would like to ask if I would ask, I'd like to ask the following: Are there any historical examples of social constitutions which were not realist, based on Fisher's understanding? Having said that, I feel like if you if we were to look at the history of social constitutions, we might find that every constitution might very well indeed be 
um, compatible with Fisher's uh, distinction on real or portrayal of realism, what is realist. Uh, having said that, um, also do alternatives exist within one context, alternatives to capitalism, alternatives to some other social constitution in the history? Uh, or are they constructed by the social practices which we, we you have talked about a little bit earlier? And I feel like when we think uh, in this regard, I feel like social practices, practices can very well be correctional power. For example, we can imagine some historical social constitutions which were which felt like you can't really get out of them. <laughs> like they, they are so deep and so, so underlying the whole reality of the social, so, the social reality that we can't really get out of them. And then it's changed. Then we had as uh, an alternative. So I feel like if we were to talk about capitalism in this regard, wouldn't you agree that they, there could be some alternatives that might be available to us after some time, after our social practices tell us, okay, this began to suck so bad, we need an alternative. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I'm inclined to think that we've already reached that stage, right? Uh, we've already reached that stage, but uh, uh, the point, but of course we do not, we might not have a clear, a clear vision of an alternative, right? And uh, uh, when you say that through history, there were other systems, uh, or as you call them, social constitutions, which were also realist about themselves. I would say, but yes, of course, right? To be modern, right? To be modern means to see society, uh, as Cavell says, as an artifact, as something we made, as, uh, as, a, as a subject of social contract, right? As something we made and we can remake it. And uh, of course, in pre-modern times, it is some. It is a topic of some discussion. I would not. Uh, I'm not prepared to have to strongly proclaim it. But there is a kind of popular opinion which I share that in pre-modern times, which is basically you know pre-revolutionary, pre-French Revolution, uh, systems were seen as natural. Right. This is they were seen seen as a part of nature. Our, our, our social systems were seen as a part of nature, and in this sense equally unchangeable, equally unchangeable as the laws of nature. But to be modern means to see that that society is something we make and remake according to our to our own uh, needs, right? And the question is, and so the claim is this, uh, if today we claim that there is no alternative, as is the famous claim of neoliberalism, right, capitalist realism, we are living in some sort of bad faith, right? We are trying to decontest something which is necessarily contested because we know there are, there are alternatives, because we can behave uh, uh, in different ways and because we know we can always uh, agree to, to, uh, uh, to, to make, remake society in a, in, in a different image. We do not know how how uh, difficult it may be. This is this is the question. This is a practical question. But we know that in principle something like that cannot be cannot be uh, uh, dismissed on the claims of being unnatural. Right. This is always a kind of ideological falsification. Thank you so kindly for the answer. And I, I, I feel like we have time for one more question. And uh, the next on the list is Hugo. Yeah, um, thank you. I really appreciate that you try to bring these two very different thinkers together, uh, speaking for myself, who both belong to some kind of Wittgensteinian and some kind of Marxist tradition. Um, now, um, and just sort of one suggestion, maybe, or one way of sort of continue the same thread that you started um, going, um, following. Um, so it might be interesting to, to connect to um, Diamond's thought about imagination in, in moral philosophy as sort of a central task, actually. Um, so, um, so that would be sort of one way of showing that um, imagination here is in certain sense part of reality. Um, we often think about sort of dreaming and imagination and fantasy and so on as sort of illusion 
which sort of um, is distinct from reality. But I think that if you really think through those um, activities, um, one will see that they are actually part of reality itself. And of course, you never know what will come out of them. Um, but the dream might show itself to just be a naive um, mistake. But on the other hand, it might turn, it will, it will have some kind of effect. You don't know which effect it will have. Um, so I think that one idea that should be criticized is the idea that reality and imagination is um, standing some kind of um, necessary conflict to each other. Um, they are, there are some kind of relation which uh, that um, imagination changes reality and in, in the other way around. So they are not identical, but still not radically separate. Um, so that would more of a comment or suggestion than a question. Excellent. I, I completely agree. Thank you. Yes. If there aren't any more questions, then I would like to thank Professor Russell Danish for the presentation. I feel like another silent clap is in order. And um, having said that, thank you ever so kindly for participating in today's session. Uh, we have one more day uh, of this conference and I hope to see you here all uh, tomorrow. And, and today we have a discussion, a discussion about the film, right? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, pardon. I, I completely forgot. In, in an hour or a little bit less than an hour, we have a discussion about the movie, A Ticket to the Moon. So I hope to see you, to see you there. Yeah, actually. Uh...